Welcome back to Love Your Money. I'm Hillary Hendershot, your host, and with me today is the lovely Jenna Banks. Welcome to the show, Jenna. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. I met Jenna because she actually interviewed me for her show, and something she said made me think to myself, I need to have this woman on the show. So let me just give you her 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 media bio, but then we're going to I'm going to hopefully get her to tell just a really inspirational money story. Uh she is a speaker, award-winning author and entrepreneur whose work has been featured in tons of media outlets including Forbes, ABC and NBC. In 2012, she founded a home-based marketing products business which she sold in 2019 for a half million dollars. So can't wait to dig in about that. Today, she helps women live to their fullest potential through writing and speaking engagements. She hosts The Jenna Banks Show, which is uh, streamed on Binge Networks, TV, Roku, uh, Apple TV, Google Play, and Amazon Fire TV. So she's like in all the places. I'm excited to talk more. Welcome. Thank you so uh, much. So when we met, so so tell me about this uh, product, market home home marketing products business. Sorry if I said those words in the wrong order. Tell me how that all got started. Yeah, well, I decided to quit my cushy corporate job and start working for myself, and um, and I just dove in, and I really didn't have a plan. It was unexpected, but I just wasn't happy. You know, I was making a nice six figure income at that job. Um, had been doing it for a while and just was, you know, bored and also bored. not challenged. Yeah. And, and it just was time for me to go. I knew there was something else in store for me. So I, I just started the journey playing around and started learning uh, about content marketing at the time. So the, mm -hmm. the business, just to be clear, was a uh, marketing product. So think promo items, like yeah. any kind of three dimensional product with a logo. And I had a history in that business in the past. Um, but I hadn't been in it for many years. So I thought, why don't I take what I've learned this last company about the internet, uh, selling products online, um, SEO, all that stuff, and then learn about content marketing and see how I could do it differently than I knew about the business in the past. In the past, the business had been more about selling in person, right? It's all about your yes. relationships, who you knew, you know, someone in marketing, great, you'll probably get their business. Well, I wanted to do it different. I wanted to cast a wide net, a worldwide net and do it online. And so I just started learning about content marketing and business started coming in and suddenly I started getting busy. And, um, you tell the story about how I sold it in 2019 for half a million dollars. The journey from starting a business in your home on the internet right. to selling it for half a million dollars was a whole learning experience that I did not have any kind of master's degree to figure out. So, right. yeah. Well, one of the things you said to me was that you found that once you decided to turn things around in the business, like maybe it was headed kind of downhill or maybe you weren't profitable and you kind of had an aha moment and said, no, I need to turn the dials until this thing is actually making money. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that? How did that happen? Yeah, it, it was okay. So my pain point was I really wanted to scale. I realized that, all right, the business is doing great now. I'm working 12 hour days. I can't take a real vacation. <laughs> A couple of years had gone by and I'm like, this is not going to work, right? This is not what I signed up for. So how do I scale? Well, the profit margins were what they were. And in doing the math, I'm thinking, how am I going to hire a workforce here in the United States um, with workman's comp and insurance, 401k and all that? Like, how am I going to afford that? So I didn't think it was doable. So then I just started getting creative. And this is where my MacGyver skills come in. I, I, I'm starting to write a talk about using your MacGyver, getting into like thinking Be like careful. MacGyver. I, I think some of our listeners may not know who MacGyver is. All right, I'll tell you who MacGyver is. So Mac I think they actually were shooting a new version of MacGyver here in Atlanta, if I'm not mistaken. It might have already come out. But MacGyver was a show, I think, back in the 70s or 80s about this 80s guy who sure. basically... <laughs> he basically, you know, the world was, you know, something was going to happen and the world was going to explode and he needed to save humanity and he did it all with the gum and the, the paper clips in his pocket. Yeah. He somehow. He always had kitty litter. Yeah. Duct tape. <laughs> yeah. Swiss army knife. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, somehow he could stop the bomb with this paperclip, you know? It's like Women everywhere just found it completely hot. <laughs> yeah. 
Exactly. Well, I've learned how to use MacGyver skills. And so I think, you know, what can I do to make this work? And it's about thinking outside the box. Like how I don't, th this is what I know. It's hire people in the U.S., but is that really the way to solve this problem? So I started thinking differently and I was like, well, how does Microsoft do it? How does the, the virtual phone company I, I, kn I know that I'm using do it? Because I know their workforce is in the Philippines. Hmm. How are they doing it? So hmm. I just started to work backwards from there. So that's my way of approaching my MacGyver skills is envision your best case scenario. And like, what would the world look like if it were running perfectly for you, your business, if it were running perfectly, and then work backwards from there. And so I thought, okay, I want to have a team overseas that's a fifth of the cost. How do I make that happen? And mm -hmm. so I ended up going through trial and error, figuring out how to hire a workforce over there. It cut my overhead by, you know, if I were to hire the same team members here, it would have cost me five times more. That's yeah. what really led me to selling the company for half a million dollars because I learned how to make the company work with very low overhead. And so my issue was, remember when we started out, I was working 12 hour days and no vacations, right? right? I said, I don't want to do that anymore. I got to the point where I was working two hour days and made the company sellable, I, I devised it in a way that I could walk away. And so, and then I will add one more thing to that. Is your audience mostly women, Hillary? Uh, mostly women, yes. That's great. Okay. Because this was uh, an issue that I was encountering, which was perfectionism. And your listeners might relate to this. A lot of us- um, uh, That's what we do. Tend to be perfectionists. And um, we think that that is an attribute. I did. I thought my perfectionism was what was making the business work, was what was making the client stick with me, was what, what was making all the income come in because I did it so perfectly. Come to find out after being so burnt out one day, I turned on an episode of Shark Tank, love that show, and Barbara Corcoran is talking to an entrepreneur and telling her why she's not going to invest. She says, I think your product is great, but you worry too much about doing everything perfectly, she says. I used to Ooh. do the same thing and it was killing me. And what transformed my business was learning that 80% is good enough. Done is done. You have to go, you know what? It's good enough. I need to move on. And that's the way you're going to be able to scale. And she says, you can't let go of perfectionism. Therefore, I can't invest in you. And that really hit me like a ton of bricks. I was I like, I can tell. Yeah. What? The universe is speaking. <laughs> Yeah, I'd never heard anything like that before. So I said, okay, I'm going to try this. Something has to give. This perfectionism isn't working for me. I'm not able to scale. So this at this point, I had already started hiring employees in the Philippines. But guess what? My perfectionism was causing me to lose them. After three, four, five months of training, a lot of oh. time and energy, and I was expecting them to work at the same perfectionist level as I was, right? Because that's what we do. Right. And you go, you burn through employees that way. So that was the next thing I had to learn was to let go of that. Once I w was was um, not so hard on myself, when I, when I learned that and implemented that 80% is good enough rule, I could then be forgiving with my workforce too. Okay, so that email wasn't perfect. Okay, so, you know, they lagged behind on this, but they're doing all these other things. Great, they, it's 80% and we're doing great and no one's gonna hold it against them if I don't. So our, we didn't lose clients and we yeah. were able to scale. So that really, those two things really allowed me to scale. And then when did you start thinking about selling it or was that always your idea from the beginning? No, it, well, I was building it to eventually sell, okay. but from what I had learned about selling a business much later on, I realized from what I had been told, which was wrong, I had been told that it's like some percentage of your EBITDA, you know, and you know, it was like, <laughs> it, 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 that the, phrase EBITDA, it's so <laughs> funny. People throw it around. It doesn't mean anything for small businesses. It's like, but it, everyone says it. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I thought, my God, all the time and energy that I put into it. And now I've made this company to where it's working for me. I make a good income and I don't have to work that many hours. I'm not going to get what it's worth to me. So why even sell it? But then I got this flyer in the mail and it was a free seminar on how to sell your business. Okay. Now I don't, I usually throw all that junk mail right. away, but I was like, man, this is like a power broker here in the city I live. 
it's free. Why not take a couple hours out of my day and, and go? So I did. Come to find out, they had a whole different technique for selling. It didn't have anything to do with some multiple of profit. It was based on selling not to competitors, but selling to like synergistic businesses who have a similar client base, who can monetize not only the clients that your company has and integrate the two together, but cross sell that company, your company's products with their current client base. So it's an instant win-win for both businesses. Mm. So you sell based on the future income base and also the trajectory. You're essentially you're selling them a customer base. That's right. Yeah. A whole different way to think about selling. So I thought, huh, this could be interesting. All right. So the reason why it was on my mind is I had gone, I gotten the opportunity to speak in front of an audience that I've, I've never done before. I was freaked out about speaking on a stage. Really? And this was at the LA Convention Center and I took it. I said, you know what? I'm going to face that fear. I'm just going to go for it. That turned out to be one of the best decisions I made because I got on stage and while it wasn't a perfect presentation, I really enjoyed seeing people light up and motivating them and <laughs> inducing some kind of action where they came to my booth afterwards and they they listened to every word I said and said, and they were making transformation in their business because of what I was telling them about how promotional products could work for them. And yeah. I thought, wow, if I could do this with marketing products, I could maybe do this on a bigger scale. And I really want to do more in my life. I want to touch people on a deeper level. I want to um, make, have an impact. I want to live in my purpose and promotional merchandise is probably not it. So um, I just wanted to be stretched again in new ways. And I've been doing it for about seven years now. It was a long time, so I thought, okay, if universe, if I put my business on the market, and if I put a price tag of a half a million dollars on it, which is what I wanted, yeah. I will sell it, and I will take this as a sign that it is time for me to move on to this next phase of my life and pursue that. If you give it to me, I will do that. And 30 days later, I had an offer on my business for half a million dollars. I feel like your life is the book by Gabby Bernstein, The Universe Has Your Back. Do you know this book? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> and I actually am shocked that I was able to come up with her name. Like I think that I think about the book title semi-frequently, but I, but it's somewhat, something somewhat remarkable that I actually thought of her name because I have that disease where I can never remember people's I'm names. I'm the same. I'm the same. <laughs> But I mean, and if we could tease apart, because most of the people listening, you know, they don't have a promotional products business, but uh, there's some of these things that you did. I mean, for example, we're all bombarded with messages. We've all watched Shark Tank, mm -hmm. but it hasn't changed our life, right? That poor woman who had to get on Shark Tank and hear that message from Barbara Corcoran. I mean, just imagine the cost of that in her life. She has to sit with that forever. I was rejected for being a perfectionist and I'll never have that opportunity again like they're not letting her back on shark tank right but you but didn't she learn have... a valuable lesson she learned and you about... did too and i did too that's right <laughs> yeah and and this one flyer that came to your house where with the opportunity to go learn from a business broker i mean how would you describe your i i guess courage gumption where does that come from what is the mindset that leads to that it is open, being open to opportunities. That's what my life is all about. Just staying mm. open to opportunities because that's how you work with the universe. I am 100% in the flow of the universe. Um, you know, we can be in resistance, right? We can be in resistance. We can have a mindset of this is the way things should be. And then you will be resistant to every opportunity the universe brings your way. But if you put an intention out there and you say, you know what, I think I'd like to go here. And then the universe starts bringing things your way. Okay, you know, and then it sends opportunities your way. You just have to notice them. Mm. And that, that's how it works. And so that is being in the flow. And so I just stay in a flow state. And that's what works for me. And it always has. You're always, you know, if I look back on my life since I was a child and, you know, in my book, I write about how, you know, I, I did not have it easy. It was a very rough childhood. And I came mm. from a very, you'd be surprised to, to know where I am today as opposed to where I came from. But, you know, I've been, I look back and I always see that I've always been taken care of. No matter how bad things were, we're always taken care of. There's always 
something looking out for you in your best interest. And, you know, it's all here to serve us. We're here to learn. We're here to learn and, and blossom into our full potential. And I really take that literally. That's how I try to live my life is, you know, how can I make the most out of this life? And, you know, we can get comfortable and we can say, okay, <clears throat> I'm working for this retirement. I'm on track. That's what you help people with, Hillary. And I love that you, you help women, you know, live to their full potential financially, but I could just sit back on that and say, okay, great. I sold my company for a half a million dollars. I've invested in these rental properties. I could take that money and stick it in the bank and you could help me with a plan to retire comfortably. But is that why I'm here? You no, know, it's clear you're living your calling. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I think, you know, many of the conversations I have with women and you have a lot of conversations with women as well. So I'm interested in your experience many women are afraid to ask for what they actually want to sort of demand to be paid to raise their prices right and i see you over here and you know you did share with me you never had a full-time employee so you don't have a you don't have someone who's right there with you someone to whom you're accountable you've always been the the one that people are accountable to right so are there days when you wake up and you think I'm terrified to make this phone call and you find you avoid it for a week or a month or, you know, are you just completely self determined? How, how, what can my listeners take from, I, I'm imagining there's a thousand times you've taken an action and you thought I didn't get the result that I wanted, but who cares? I'm, I'm going, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Tell me about that mindset in you. Is it, it I mean, and I know you, you've already said you, you're out to create a narrative with the universe where, you know, you're living your one, your one precious life. But in that moment, when you were pressing send on that email or picking up the phone to make that terrifying call, what is it? What is the voice that's guiding you? Um, I mean, what's the worst that could happen? They say no. <laughs> Right. I mean, truly. And, you know, I, I do a lot of work with women. That is, you know, where I'm called to work yeah. and to to serve. Um, we have a lot of limiting beliefs, a lot of self-doubt, a lot of imposter syndrome. And, you know, <clears throat> I was talking to this amazing woman on my show yesterday, Nina Simons. She is the co-founder of a, an amazing organization called Bioneers. They're affecting the world and they're making massive change. She wrote this really incredible book for women leaders. And she talks about how she, she mentioned something in her book and we talked about it on the, on my episode yesterday about how she, something she watched changed her life forever. It was a, a, a old documentary called the burning times. I've yet to watch it, but I'm going to. Um, and it, and it overviews how we were as women, burned at the stake for a long time, being accused of being witches and whatever. And this was across massive swaths of land. And the impact, if you look in, if you know anything about epigenetics, um, or if you don't, I'll give you a, just a brief summary of that, what epigenetics is, and I'm not a scientist, so I'm probably going to butcher this, but in, in essence, what it means is uh, these traumas are passed down through us genetically. It's the and they, intergenerational traumas, yeah. Yeah, so it lives in our cells, it lives in our genes. And I'm sure there's some evolutionary reason for that. And perhaps it serves us in some good ways, but it also serves us in some bad ways. And so as a result, as women, we have this trauma that sits in us still to this day that makes us believe these things like we're not worthy, um, you know, who am I to do this? We doubt ourselves. And also there's another amazing book called The Genius of Women by Janice Kaplan, where she talks about we haven't had these women geniuses to look at as role models. Not that we weren't it. We just weren't given credit when we were doing these genius things because we've been in a patriarchy for so long. And so we doubt ourselves, right? We think, oh my God, what if, and what if I fail? And again, here we go into that perfectionism. It has to, if it's not a yes, <laughs> right. then it's, uh, I failed in some way. And we have to get over that and just go, you know what? Okay. I might not get a yes this time, but again, being in that flow state with the universe, every no kind of redirects you to the place where you are supposed to go to get that yes. You know, if you really believe what's meant for me will be, 
then you don't worry about the no's. You don't worry about the rejections. You don't worry about the, the things that don't go the way you would like them to go. It's, it's just not meant for you. That's all. What you just said reminds me of something that I've said. I, I think I did a podcast episode about it a couple years ago. This idea that when you hate on other women for being successful, oh, that's too much. I would never want to be that successful. Oh, she's an executive. She's probably not a good mom, right? I'm just sort of, these yes. are some of the, the things we I hear said or thought because I spend so much time talking to women. And it's often, not often the women who are talking to me, but they, these women have heard from their so-called friends, you know, and I said, you know, th this is, this is us essentially foisting the patriarchy on each other, right? 100%. We've embodied this voice that's like, women shouldn't be too big, shouldn't yep. be too powerful, shouldn't receive too much, definitely shouldn't want to be rich, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so I, I, that's why I call finance the last frontier of feminism. It's mm. like, we're taking ground everywhere else, right? It has to be okay for us to be multimillionaires. Can we just talk about that for a minute, Hillary? Because I think that's yes, super important. Yes, interview me. Okay. <laughs> no, no, but honestly, I mean, this is what you do to help empower women. And, and I talk about this as well in my book. And I want to do more episodes about it on my show because... It's so important that we be in our power and having money is power, is freedom. You know, in the patriarchy, we look to men to be the money earners and uh, put all our energy into the men and the men earn the money and they take care of the family and all of that. But, you know, if we're going to do what we're meant to do in this world and, and have a feminine impact on the world, we need money to be able to do it. If I didn't have the money from selling my business and having rental properties and being independent and having my own money where no one else, I wasn't accountable to anyone else for Correct. how I spent that money. I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing now. I'm getting a, I'm getting on stage in a couple months in front of 500 women leaders to talk about the power of self-love, you know? That's I awesome. wouldn't have been able to afford to do that if I hadn't invested in myself like I had, if I hadn't followed the flow of the universe. We haven't had that kind of money as women to be able to do these things and money gives us independence, it gives us freedom, it gives us ability to think creatively without you know, the guilt and the shame and the self judgments and all of that stuff. We have to learn how to shed all of that and embrace money because with money, we can do so much more to impact the world for good. And that is a different way of thinking about money. You're speaking my language. You and I were telling the same message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I look around and I hear women say, I, I, you know, and I talk about it a lot. I, I, oh, I don't need to be rich. I don't need to be a millionaire. I sent out an email a couple months ago. So it said the subject line was, yes, you actually do need to be a millionaire, <laughs> you know, because it's like, first of all, logistically, financially speaking, a million dollars is really not enough to retire no. in most places in this country. So yes, you do need to be a millionaire, uh, but also why not? Right. If we're going to emancipate and free ourselves from the the remaining amounts of misogyny and, and patriarchy we do suffer from, uh, we need to be self-determined. And that mm -hmm. I feel like, um, and I do want to talk about your current messaging and what you're doing now. But I mean, when I hear your story, I, it just screams self-determined to me. You know, I just see you as this force of... No, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get up on time. I'm going to do the things. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to build a business a couple times. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I, I think um, I, I'm just impressed with your embodied energy. Like you must have a, a lot of energy to keep doing this. <laughs> a lot of energy. I'm so glad you bring this up, Hillary, because I do want to talk about that. Um, it will transition to what I do now, which is self-love, uh, talking about self-love and the power of self-love. You know, we something there's this really amazing book and I, I, I the reason why I keep referring to books is is because these are books that have impacted my life in big ways. You know, there's this book called The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. I probably mm -hmm. read it 40 to 50 times. Really? If you've never gotten it, go on to Amazon right now, everybody, and get a copy. It's tiny. It's seven simple laws of the way the universe works written by Deepak Chopra. And it is quite profound, super deep, very simply explained. 
but it it's a lot to absorb um and you can read it in in like an hour or two so it's really beautifully written one of the things he says and really hit me hard was um that we look externally for reference about who we are whether we're being liked you know, um, it does, does, are you validating me? If so, then that's okay for me. What happens is when we look externally for approval, we end up changing who we are. We're actually not authentic. We are not even really who we really are because we're always looking outside of ourselves for answers. Like, do you like me? Am I, uh, uh, oh, you don't like what I'm doing? You like right. my hair better blonde? You like it better short? You don't, oh, you don't like that? Like, oh, you like my boobs big? Like what, we change ourselves based on what other people, we see other people liking. And then we just become a version of ourselves that we don't even know. We don't even know. So switching that to being an internally referenced, just reference your internal self. When you, it's, it's a, it takes years of practice. It took me years of work to learn to do it. And I still catch myself finding myself going, oh, do, do they like what I'm saying? Maybe I should change my messaging a little and water it down, you know, but that's not being true to me. So when you look inside and say, well, what do I like? What do I want to do? What's, what's calling me? Even if nobody relates, <laughs> what is it that's true to me? And then when you can start to go and start to say, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to leave this corporate job that's paying me six figures because I feel called to do something else. Who cares if my grandmother thinks I'm crazy and now she's going to go, unfortunately, into a deep depression because I've made a financial decision for myself. See, that's another example of looking externally. We look externally with our family and then they guilt trip, trip us, right? Or my dad, you know, put all of his time and money into me to send me to this school. I don't want to let him down. We right. have all these obligations and things that make us look outside of ourselves and and we just don't question it. We just do it unquestionably. But unfortunately, what happens is we learn to deny who we really are. And that's what's missing today, I believe. If we can just go inside and learn to just reference ourselves and say, I'm sorry, mom and dad. I'm sorry, grandma. I'm, you're going to have to go through your own adjustment. But this is me <laughs> being me. This is how I'm going to be happy. And that's how I have so much energy to do these things. Because I have my energy back. So if, if to the extent you've managed to become self-referenced, that is, I feel like, a whole course on living. So that is amazing to hear. Thank you for talking. We'll mention the book in the link, a link below the show notes uh, for today's episode. You're, as a segue to that, your current website is full of messaging about both self-love and power. So talk a little bit about how your spreading the word and how you're making money. What are you doing in the world today? Today, I am an author. This is my book. I love me more. So you mentioned that. I love me more. Nice. And I wrote that during COVID. Um, and then it came out last year. So since then, what I've been doing is focused on what I promised the universe I would do, which is get out there and speak, get on stages. And so I'm doing a lot of uh, speech preparation right now uh, for my talks. Yeah. And that's led me into doing moderating and emceeing. Um, and uh, slowly but surely, that is becoming my source of income. But it's taken a lot of investment into myself to get there. So that is, but you know, that is where I feel called to go and grow. So um, I talk a lot about self love on my website. I would highly recommend if you're interested in learning more about all the details of self love, it's very, um nuanced and a lot deeper than most of us think about it's not just bubble baths it's a lot of deep work <laughs> no. um check out either my book or i've got a free email series um called love notes to myself you can sign up right on my uh, website totally free i send it out a few times a week and amazing. it just helps people learn all the nuances of self-love Amazing. Jenna, I feel like our meeting was so serendipitous. I just, I'm so in awe of what you've done and what you're doing. Congratulations Thank on you. being, I just keep thinking of you as self-determined. I'm just like, Jenna is a force of power. So um, definitely we'll put links to all the places to find you, including love notes to myself um, and your, of course, YouTube and video series, which is amazing. 